Good morning, friends and family of Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship. We're here in Seattle, Washington, and if you live in our area, we would love to have you come out to our church. It's in Shoreline, 15415 Fifth Avenue, Northeast in Shoreline, Washington. We're glad that you've joined us today, whether you can be here in person or not. We want to thank you for joining us. We want to thank you for your prayers for us, for your support for everything that you do and uh, just for listening in because we want the Word of God to be disseminated in such a way that everyone that is out there can hear the Word for themselves, can take it into their hearts, and those seeds can be planted deep in our hearts and grow. We want to see you grow. We want to see you develop a close relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to see you flourish in spiritual things. We want to see you active, not just sitting in a church, just sitting in a pew, uh, but we want to see you uh, take the things that are taught to you in church, the things that are taught to you online, and take those out to the world and just be a real witness for Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining us. Um, before we be getting started today, I want to remind you that if you've missed any of our previous messages, you can find those at our website, shorelinefullgospel.org. You can also find them on our YouTube channel, which is Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship or on my personal YouTube channel, Tom Loud. On my YouTube channel as well, you can find uh, all kinds of resources that will teach you how to operate in the things of the Spirit, how to grow spiritually, how to just be able to go out there and do the work of God in an unsaved world and to show people Jesus Christ, to be a light unto them. So check those resources out. I always suggest uh, starting at a series I did called Unlocking Kingdom Power, Parts 1 through 5. If you watch that, I believe it can change your life. So thank you once again for tuning in. I'm going to open with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all of those out there who, Lord, are seeking your will for their lives and all those, Lord, that are listening to the words that we speak, Lord, and allowing them to be planted deeply in their hearts. Let those things that we speak as by the Holy Spirit. Let them take root in people's hearts. Let them grow up to fruition, Lord, and bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to turn it over right now to my brother, um, Reverend Aaron Baker, for a time of worship, and then we'll get into the message. God bless you. Well, good morning. These people have I made for myself, said the Most High that they might show forth praise. Are you ready? I welcome you this morning. I'm ready to praise. I hope you're ready to praise. But before we begin, let us give thanks and pray. Thank you, Father, for this time, for this honor. Thank you for this moment to open our mouths and open our hearts to give you glory, Lord. We present it to you humbly and gratefully and we ask you to move mightily today through your word and through your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
Welcome back. Thank you, Aaron, for that wonderful song. Today's message is titled, Living in the Moment. Now, I wonder how much time we've wasted in our lives taking our eyes off of the road that's right before us and staring for hours and hours into the rearview mirror. It's kind of a bad idea, isn't it? It sounds kind of foolish to drive with your eyes fixated on the rearview mirror. It sounds kind of dangerous as well. So picture yourself in a car moving down the highway in front of you at 60 miles per hour. The highway is just whipping past you, whipping past you, but you're never looking out the windshield. You're watching everything that's happening in the rearview mirror. In other words, you see it after it happens and that's your fixation. Is that the way you drive? Is that a good way to drive? Is that a way you think you should drive from this point on? Or do you think maybe if you've been doing that, you should change things. If you were in reverse, then that might make sense. If you were standing still, it wouldn't be so bad. But the fact of the matter is that you are moving down the highway forward at a very rapid pace. And by the time you see things in the rearview mirror, it's too late. Now this analogy I have brought up because it's an accurate depiction of how most people live their lives. You have to think about that. Most people live their lives thinking long periods of time on the things of the past, the things they could have, should have, would have done, the things that went wrong, the things that they have bitterness about, the things that they have sorrow about, the, the missed opportunities. A lot of people spend their time looking at the past instead of looking at the road that is right in front of them. And when you operate like that, you miss 
life in the present. If you're fixated on the past, you cannot enjoy life in the present because you can't be in two places at one time. Now, those people don't ever really get to enjoy life because they miss being focused on other things that have nothing to do with right now. And right now is the time wherein you live your life. You don't live your life in the past. You don't live your life in your future. You live your life in the right now, the present. You might think looking at the past all the time doesn't really cost you anything, but it does cost you something. If you spend an hour focused on the past, you've had to use up an hour of the present to do that. And so we miss life as it unfolds around us because we're fixated on life that was and can never be again. If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves never looking around about us and seeing life as it is right now, never smelling the roses, never seeing the sights, experiencing the sounds of the present. And if that's the case, you're really not living at all. It's like life's a big recording, but nothing's live. Now, we all have probably heard of Paul's technique of handling this problem, but have we just read it or have we taken it to heart? Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Paul says this, Not that I have already obtained all this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, listen to this, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. That's a forward direction towards what is ahead. Press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. So Paul says, uh, you know, I have not achieved my final destiny, my final goal, my final fulfillment of everything I want to do in life yet for the Lord. He says, but I keep my eyes on the road ahead and I keep moving forward. I don't waste my time looking at the past. He says, forgetting those things that are behind me, I press on forward. Paul's living in the moment that he's in. He's trying his very best to focus on what's happening around him so he can make the very best decisions. Not so that he can look back and say, oh, I should have done this or should have done that. Now understand this, Paul and the rest of us are being carried at a rapid and a constant speed forward through time. You cannot go back in time. None of us can stop time. None of us can go back, but what we can do is we can steer as we go forward into a particular direction that we desire. You can steer towards God's goal for you, or you can do your own thing, but you have the ability to make choices that will affect your final destiny. Paul's destination was for something else. He was steering towards a goal that was of eternal value. He wasn't looking for the things on this earth to please him, but he was looking for those things that are eternal. Philippians 3.14, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing towards anything in particular? Are you steering this vehicle that you're in for life, this body? Are you steering it as you go down the road at this rapid pace? Are you steering it in any way in particular so that you end up in any place in particular? Are you just letting the wheel go and letting it end up wherever it goes in whatever ditch it runs off into? We need to live life intentionally. We need to make the decisions that direct our life in the direction that will please God. Now, don't bother telling me or anybody else that you're actually pressing forward towards something if you're spending most of your time looking behind you in the past because it can't be done. You have to put those things behind you and look forward. Well, as I've been saying, some people keep their eyes fixated on that rear view mirror, but there's another group of drivers. They're a little bit different. They have a different problem. We might call them the oblivious driver. They're the ones whose mind really isn't on driving at all but on their various plans for the future. They are off in their own little world why the car keeps going straight forward, dreaming about what they would like to do someday, not paying attention to the road that is right in front of them. This too can be a hazardous way to live life, a hazardous way of driving. And this too can rob you from experiencing life in the now and in the present, which is where you live your life. And make no mistake about it, life is only lived and experienced in the now. It's never in the future. So how much of real life, life in the present, do you want to waste? How much of this life 
as you're here right now today how much of it do you want to waste to say I'm gonna waste it on thinking about the future so much that I can't enjoy right now I want to I'm going to waste it on thinking of the past, all my regrets or the things I could have done or the good old days, whatever it is, so that I can't experience what's happening right now. God wants you to live in the right now and make decisions right now that will steer you in a direction right now that will end up in the destination he's called you to. Time is a very precious asset and it's given to us in a limited and unknown quantity. We don't know how much time we have. We are not promised tomorrow, the Bible says, so it's really important that we spend today doing the things that really count. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says this, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. In other words, make the very best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You need to understand what the will of the Lord is so that you can begin to steer in that direction. So if you've been awakened to the fact yet that each moment of your life is precious and that you aren't promised one more moment beyond tomorrow, beyond today, then you ought to want to spend the time that you have in the present doing the things that please the Lord and that cause you to have eternal gain. So here's a question. If you're going to live your life for God in the way that God intended, what should your daily life look like if you're living it right? If you're living the life that God is intended for you to live, what does it look like? Well, let me just say this. Most of us are not living the way Jesus intends for us to live. Because before we can put forth an effort to live as we should, we need to know what that looks like. We need to know how God wants our lives to look. It probably doesn't look a lot like we live right now. But as long as we have breath, we can change our direction as we're moving forward and begin to steer in the proper direction, the direction that pleases God and fulfills his will for our lives. You have to want it, though. You have to want it. You know, if you don't want it, you're not going to put your heart in it, and you're going to just backslide in this whole process. But if you really want it, you want to live a life that pleases God. You want to fulfill the plan he has for your life, then you're going to have to desire it, want it, and you're going to have to step out and begin to do something. And you have to know what you need to do to get on the right course. You need to see the plan God has. You need to understand where God wants you to go and when he wants you to make a turn. You need to understand those things. And a lot of us have no plan. We're just daydreaming. We're just driving down the road of life. And when it ends, we go, oh, is it over? We need to live our life intentionally. We need to steer in a direction that is intentional. And it's a direction that has been mapped out by God in his word. He tells us how to live, but we pay very little attention to what he's told us to do and how to live our daily right now lives. Well, let's begin to discover what life should look like as God has planned it for us, how he intended for us to live, how our daily life should actually look. And I'm gonna start with some specific parts pieces and parts that we need to incorporate and each part is important and if we will get all of the parts gathered together then we will be able to connect them together in such a way to accomplish a marvelous work in our lives that will become the framework for a whole new way of living the way that God has always intended for us to live we're not living in that way I guarantee you most people hearing my voice 99.9% .9 we're not living the way God intended us to live but we can if we just know what that is and if we will press towards that mark. So here are some of the parts and pieces and we're gonna put them together in a way that makes sense a little bit later, but let's get the parts and the pieces first. We're gonna start with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. That's one part. Now. I'm not going to go into the explanation yet. I'm just going to give you the part. So there's one part. Here's the next part. Ephesians 5.20 Giving thanks at all times for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God and the Father. Now, I'm going to comment on that in a little while, but that's just another part to the puzzle, part of what we're building here to a life that pleases God. Here's another part. Hebrews 13.15 through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly profess his name. 
Now, here's several extra parts that are all found in one place. They're found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 18. Make sure that no one repays evil for evil. Always pursue what is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice at all times. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in every circumstance. Listen to this. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God has a plan for you. This is Christ's will for you. This is God's will for you. He has a desire. He didn't just say, pick what you want. He says, I have a will for you. Now let's look at Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, if you actually paid attention to these parts, to these instructions from God's word, if you actually paid attention to them, if you actually collected them together, hooked them together and said, this is the way I'm going to begin to live life, it would dramatically change the look of your life. It would change the direction of your life. It would change the atmosphere that surrounds you in the right here, in the right now. And do you know what atmosphere it would produce? It would produce a profound awareness of God's presence in your every moment of every day of life. Now, wouldn't you want that? Can you imagine if you could always experience the presence of God? You were aware of it always. You will begin to feel he's so close to you. You'll feel his breath on your neck. You'll begin to feel that the air around you charged with his presence. You'll begin to feel his majesty and his holiness and his awesomeness on a daily basis. Is that where you want to live your life? That's where I want to live my life. So once again, back to the car analogy. The fact of the matter is this. When you're traveling in your car and your thoughts are somewhere else, you're daydreaming about something else, you're thinking about something else, you cannot fully experience what is actually around you at the present. You don't even realize, oh, how did I get here? Oh, I drove home and didn't see a thing because my head was so off in the, some other distant thought. You miss living life in the now because you're not paying attention to the now. You're paying attention to something else, something in the past or something in the future or something that's just a distraction that the enemy has put in your life. To live in the present, you gotta have your eyes fixated on the road in front of you and make choices as to how you steer on this road. God's presence can only be experienced in the present. Think about that. You can only experience something in the present. You can't experience in the past because the past is gone. You can't experience it in the future because it's not here yet. You can experience it in the right now. And God's presence can only be experienced by those who are present right now with him. You can reminisce about God's presence in the past. That's, a, that's fine. That's fine. You can dream about experiencing more of God's presence in the future. That's fine. But that is not experiencing God's presence. That's just thinking about it. But if you will put together the parts of these scriptures that we have laid out so far, we've plucked from the Bible in different places. If we put those together, it'll begin to shape up and take a form of a life that God actually wants us to live in the present. We can start living in his presence in the present, and you will begin to have joy unspeakable and full of glory as the Bible talks about. Life will not suck if you will live in his presence. Psalm 1611, thou will show me the path of life. Now that's what we're talking about. Lord, what is the path of life you have for me? Show it to me. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. What more could you want? Pleasures forevermore. What more could you want? Fullness of joy. What more could you want? Where is that found? in his presence, and you can only experience his presence in the present. Now suppose you were traveling together on a road trip with someone else, and along the way was the Grand Canyon. And suppose you always wanted to see the Grand Canyon yourself in person, but while you were riding along in the car, you were busy looking at your phone. Then sometime later, you lift your head and you say to the driver, when are we gonna get to see the Grand Canyon? And the driver says to you, oh, we already passed it. Weren't you looking? That's the way we live life. We don't look at what's around us. We look at what's ahead or what's behind us. And we don't get to see what God is doing right in the here and now. And he wants us to live in the presence. Well, even though you went by the Grand Canyon, as far as you're concerned, you've never seen it and you've never been there, even though you actually were, because you weren't aware. Well, I want to let you in on a very real truth. If you're saved, Listen to this. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you right now. In fact, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in and go. He abides in you 
forever. In the presence of God, the Bible says, is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. But if we're too distracted and not paying attention, it can seem like he's never around. And therefore, you never get to benefit from the fullness of joy, from the pleasures that are forevermore, because you're not aware of his presence, because you're so fixated on what's behind or what's ahead. You're not enjoying the presence right now. And that's the only place you can enjoy it, is in the right now. God wants us to be aware of where we're at, always present right now, that we're in his presence right now. Because if he's there with you in your heart, but you're not aware of that because your head's someplace else, you're never going to be able to enjoy the fact he's there, right there in your heart. So even though he's present, it'll seem like he isn't present. Our attentions, unbridled and undirected, will find some place to go if we don't direct them. We need to begin to direct our attention on the things that matter. How did we miss something as marvelous as the presence of God? We pray for the presence of God to come down and God must be looking at us like we're crazy. It's like, I live in you and you're praying for my presence? Well, I want it to manifest. He goes, I live in you. You're going to find it in here if you will stop and look and pay attention. But the problem is we're so distracted. We're distracted by the things of the world. They could be good, they could be bad. They could be the horrible news that's on the television or the wonderful thing that you're going to do, the, the trip you're going to take next week. Whatever it is, it's a distraction from right now. And God wants us to live in the present. So let's take those parts that we brought up a little bit earlier from the Bible and let's begin to put them together and see what a life lived for God in God's presence going in the right direction, what our life should actually look like. Not a model life for the Apostle Paul, but one for you and for me that God intended us to live. See if our life, I don't think it does look very close to it, but if our life doesn't look very close to it, see if perhaps we can begin to steer our lives in that direction. Well, one thing I want to mention is in every scripture we brought up earlier, there was a statement that concerned time. You know, words like today, like now, at all times, continually, always. Those were found in many of those scriptures. So let's look at those scriptures again, and let's now put them together and build a clear picture of what our lives could be like if we would begin to follow God's instructions daily in the present, in the now. Here was the first part. Let's take a look at it and let's determine if we actually do what it says or if we don't. And if we don't, let's make a decision to say we will begin to do it today. Lord, we will follow your directions for fulfilling a godly life you plan for us. We started with Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. So let's look at that again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Okay, here's a question. In how many ways do we acknowledge him? In all of our ways. What if you actually acknowledge God in all of your ways? I mean, in everything you do day in, day out, you acknowledge the Lord. I'm not just saying acknowledge him in the sense of saying, Lord, what should I do? But I mean acknowledging his presence with you in the situation. Acknowledging that even as I go to the bank right now, as I go to the store right now, Lord, you're with me. I'm acknowledging that. Even as I make this hard decision, Lord, you're with me. I'm acknowledging that. Even, even as I face this great challenge, Lord, you're with me. I acknowledge you in all my ways. In everything I do, I acknowledge your presence. That's being aware of his presence. That's making yourself focus on his presence. That will cause you to begin to experience his presence in everything you do. And I guarantee this, if you're aware of the Lord being with you in everything you do, in every place you go, you will begin to behave differently. Because you're not going to cuss people out on the freeway if you say, but Jesus is right here with me. You're not going to look at pornography if you say, but Jesus is right here with me. You're going to act in such a way that pleases the Lord if you realize he's right there with you. Acknowledge him in everything that you do. Everything that you do. The programs you watch and allow yourself to watch on TV. The movies you allow yourself to watch. Say, but Jesus is right here with me. Acknowledge him in all those choices. Now that's the first piece. Begin to acknowledge the Lord in everything. He's with you at all times. Here's the next part. Ephesians 5.20. Give thanks at all times for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to the God and Father. All right. What if you actually understood that this is not a suggestion? 
But this is actually God's command for you and me. And if we would follow it, we would become obedient sons and daughters. And if we don't follow it, we are disobedient. And what did he say? Giving thanks at all times. How often? At all times. Can you imagine if you began to say, I'm going to start obeying the Lord. In all times, all times, every hour of the day, I'm going to be giving thanks. You go, thanks for what? I can't think of what to thank for right now. You know what? If you can't think of anything, you can always say this. You can all, thank you, Lord, that you're so good to me. You can say that. You could just say that. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. You can just say that. And then you can thank him for the things you actually see him doing. But if you gave thanks at all times, it would change your whole life. Now, that's not just something that's for the Apostle Paul or for Peter or for John. That's something that's intended for every single disciple. He intends for us to acknowledge him in all of our ways and to give thanks at all times. Are you doing that? I don't think you are. I don't. But I want to start now. I want to start giving thanks at all times, without exception. How often? At all times. Here's another piece to the puzzle, Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually, did you hear that? Another, another time-related word. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips that openly profess his name. Another version says, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. It says, let us continually... How often is that? All the time. Every day, even on my bad days, all the time. Not just on Sunday, all the time. Not just while I'm fasting and paying attention. Every moment of every day, let us continually be offering up sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to Jesus. Wow, if I live that kind of life, it sure be different than what I live. Exactly. That's the life God wants you to live. He wants you to live in his presence. And in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And you have to be present in the present to, to experience God's presence. And you have to begin to do those things which acknowledge God's presence. All right, so once again, how often should we be offering sacrifice of praise? It says continually. Now that can't be talking about the past. And it can't be talking about the future. Because you can't be offering something in the past. It's, it's already done. It's gone. You can't be offering something in the future. It's not here yet. You can only offer it in the right now. And this is when you need to offer it. And if you offer it in the right now, every day you're offering these praises, then you can look back in your past and, and you will see that you have been doing this for a long time. And that's your way of life. That's what you live in. It can't be something that's sporadic. We have to be doing this on a daily basis. Do you want to begin to obey that command or do you say, that's not for me? This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us. What do you want, your will or his will? If you don't, then you can't be claiming to live a life for God. You're just doing your own thing. Now, here's a cluster of things found in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we talked about earlier. And today, if we will begin to do these things for the rest of our lives, it will change your whole course of life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 18. Make sure that no one repays evil for evil. Don't get back. Don't take revenge. Always, there's that, there's that word that has to do with time. Always pursue what is good for one another and for other people. Pursue what is good for somebody else. Look to bless somebody else. But what about me? If you pursue good for someone else, God will make sure that you get good as well. So how often should I be pursuing good for someone else? It says always. Does that include today? Yeah, it includes tomorrow too. It includes the next day too. It includes the rest of your life. And then it says, verse 16, rejoice at all times. Wow, that's, that's a hard thing. Certainly the Lord would understand if we don't feel like it, right? No, actually, he says, I told you to do it, but I don't feel like it. He says, do it even when you don't feel like it. Be giving forth thanksgiving and praise even when you don't feel like it because this will change your situation and the atmosphere of God's presence around you so that your situation can turn into a blessing instead of being the horrible thing that you don't want to experience. Now, as we all know, when it says rejoice at all times, the word all in the Bible, as it's been put many times before, all means all, all the time. And another thing it says in verse 17, pray without ceasing. 
can you imagine can you imagine if you lived a life like this just as we've gone so far can you imagine if you lived a life where you're acknowledging the Lord's presence in everything that you do where you're continually giving thanks to the Lord for in every situation where you're offering up thanksgiving and praise to God all the time where you looking to do good for others all the time can you imagine what that would be like it'd be nothing like your life looks today would it well that's telling us something we're not living the life God intended us to live but if we would we would experience God's presence all the time and what happens if you experience God's presence all the time well in his presence is fullness of joy at his right hand are pleasures forevermore what more could you possibly want so this last scripture we read verse 17 first Thessalonians 5 pray without ceasing that means without stopping now wait a minute that would take some kind of concerted effort I mean it's easy to get distracted surely it means pray when you have some time right no, it means pray without ceasing. Does that include today? Yeah, it includes today. It includes today and forever forward. Does that mean that we have to spend all day on our knees? No, that's not what it's talking about. It means we have to stay connected in our conversation with God throughout the whole day and as long as we are awake. We keep a conversation going. Prayer is a conversation between us and our Heavenly Father. We keep it going. Sometimes it's asking for things, but sometimes prayer is just talking to God, just telling him how good he is. Just saying, Lord, which way would you like me to go? It's just talking and conversing with God. Keep the line open. Never hang the phone up on God. Always leave the line open. That is praying without ceasing. Then we get to verse 18 in 1 Thessalonians 5. Now listen to this. Give thanks in every circumstance. That's not all it says. I'll just start with that. Give thanks in every circumstance. Wait, this is a terrible circumstance that I'm in right now. I know you're not giving thanks for it. You're giving thanks in it. In the midst of the circumstance, you begin to praise God and God will take hold of your circumstance and change things. But here's what it says. Give thanks in every circumstance. Well, I don't know if I want to do that. I want to complete the verse. Give thanks in every circumstance. Listen to this. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You want to know what God's will is? People say, I want to know what God's will is. I'm going to go to the prophet and find out what God's will is. Tell me what God wants me to do. Well, you know what? Start with the plain things. First thing he wants you to do is live a life where you give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't like that will. Then you don't want God's will. If you really want God's will, you'll say, I want that. I want to begin to do what pleases him. Now, does God really expect us to give thanks in every circumstance? Yes, in the midst of the circumstance, he does. But if I actually obeyed God's word and began now to do all these things we just talked about that he's told us from his word, my life would look radically different than it's ever been. That's right, it would. And that's the life he wants you to live. You see, if your life looks so much different than what I've described, and most of us ours does, we're not walking in the center of God's will. We say we want to, we need to begin to do it. What would that kind of life actually be like if we live that life that is described in God's word that we should be living. Isaiah 26, three says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You know what? If you keep your mind, your awareness of the right now stayed remaining on the Lord, on his presence, you'll find that you're in perfect peace. Do you want perfect peace? How many people don't live in perfect peace? Much of the reason people don't live in perfect peace is because they don't keep their mind on Jesus. They keep their mind on everything else. And those are distractions that are on the left and on the right. And those are the distractions that are in the future and in the past, but they're not in the right here, right now, where you're at today. And that's where God wants us to stay in the present because he's ever present. He's never in the past. He's always in the right now. He is the God who is. He says, I am that I am. That word am means is in the present term. He's always in the present tense. God is never in the past. He's always in the present. He lives outside of time, always in the present. He wants us to live always in his presence. Now, who doesn't want to have perfect peace? Who doesn't want to have fullness of joy? Who doesn't want to have pleasures forevermore? Now, pleasures forevermore, that kind of sounds like up in heaven, I'll get this great pleasure that lasts for eternity. But that is not exactly what it's saying. Forevermore means it starts here 
and goes all the way into heaven. It's not like someday when we get to heaven, you get pleasure here as you walk in the Lord beginning today. The moment you begin to walk in the Lord this way, you begin to experience the pleasures that last forever. So if your life doesn't look like this, this is the moment in time to get your eyes back on the road, to put your hands in the wheel, and to begin to steer in this direction and say, I'm going to do what the Lord has told me through his word. I'm no longer going to say, that's a nice thought. I'm going to say, this is God's will for me in Christ Jesus. When God tells you what his will is for you, what should be your answer? Should it be, I'll consider it? I don't think I can do that. But I had a different plan for my life. The only right answer is yes, Lord. I'm here to do your will. I'm here to glorify you with a life that demonstrates your goodness, your power, and your love for all people. Stop waiting to live this life. Begin living it right now. Live your life with intentionality for the Lord. Living in this life in such a way that we are acknowledging his presence at all times. We're walking in his presence. We're walking in the spirit. And this is what it looks like to live a life that God has planned for us. I know that's challenging. It challenges me too. But thank God for a plan. Thank God that the picture has been painted clearly because now you know what to aim towards. Let's begin to walk this life and watch what God does with your life. It'll look nothing like it used to look. It'll be marvelous. God bless you. I hope you enjoy your day in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to my wife now for a closing prayer. Thank you. Good morning. I'm so glad, and so is Henry, that you could join us today for another beautiful Sunday. I just thank the Lord that in another week, a little over another week, we're going to be able to uh, celebrate together springtime and uh, springing ahead, we get to set our clocks ahead an hour and we'll see more daylight hours, which will be lovely. Um, along this line, I just wanted to tell you today and encourage your hearts that God is good. Um, some of you were there Wednesday night when I did my series on Made for His Pleasure and our theme was uh, understanding intimacy with God is knowing who He is and that that's pleasant to Him. He wants us to know Him. And one of the very, very key aspects of his nature, in addition to we know he is love, is that God is good. So many people were raised with maybe a parent or authoritarian figure, um, a person maybe that raised them that didn't have uh, a good imprint on them. I'm here to tell you that no matter what, we all in the family of Christ have the same father and our Abba Father, he is good. So one of the verses of the many that I covered on Wednesday night was uh, Psalms 107 verses 8 and 9. And it says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. So what I emphasized in this is number one, if we would just give thanks and praise to God, knowing that his nature is good, that he wants us to understand that he satisfies not just those that are half-hearted, but the ones that are seeking, that are hungry souls. And we wanna be hungry souls for God because he says to the hungry will be filled, right? And those that seek and seek diligently, they'll be rewarded and they will find. So we want to be hungry seekers of the Lord. Proverbs goes on to tell us that to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet, but the full soul or the complacent soul loathes even the honey in the honeycomb. We want to be people that don't just take our father for granted, but recognize he's not just a father. He's a good father, a father who gives us every good and perfect gift, a father who pronounced over his creation on the sixth day that all the works of his hands and everything that he had made was very good. This is the self-same father who is not only called good and declared himself good and is good to his creation and gives good gifts to his children, but he can also transform evil into good. And what I mean by that is there's two verses we can think of right off the top of our head. One is found in 
the uh, towards the end of Genesis. You know it well. In conclusion, the story of Joseph, where he had been betrayed by his brothers wrongfully and sold into slavery, and even put in prison and forgotten about in an Egyptian jail. At the conclusion of all this, when Joseph's brothers came to get grain from him, and they finally discovered the true identity of the brother they had betrayed, they feared for their lives. And Joseph, sensing this, let them know that this evil that you meant for me, that you intended for me, God meant for good and to turn around to save many people alive. That's our God. Also, you know the verse in Romans where it says, Paul tells us that God works all things together for good to those who love him. So I've got good news. All things in this life, even the hard things, don't always necessarily work out for good to everyone. But for those that are called according to his purpose, those who love him, those who have hungry souls, not only are they going to find the lover of their souls, not only are they going to find uh, their heart's contentment and satisfaction in him, but it says they will be filled. They will be fully satisfied. And he will be found by those that seek him when they seek with their whole heart. So I just want to encourage you today, no matter what you're going through, no matter what challenges you're facing, um, whatever struggles, whatever disappointments, I want to remind you that you serve a God that is good and he is personally involved with his creation and he loves you with an everlasting love. After all, mankind and the animals were two of his creations that he specifically handmade. He didn't just speak them into existence. So God has a personal investment in you and in me as sons and daughters, and he loves us very much. And as a good father, he will withhold no good thing from those that ask him for those that are serving him and walking uprightly before him. So let's press in and press on knowing that ours is a good heritage with a good father. In Jesus' name, amen.